Hello, this is Sweden calling. Um, I hope that my uh, video works and that you can hear me. Um, maybe I can get a thumbs up or something like that on on uh, on this. Uh, it looks like everything is green to me, um, but you never know. Um, I'm just about to start talk soon. Look, I got a thumbs up, so it's, it seems like I am on live. Oh, hello Eva. Trevligt att se dig. Nice to see you again. Uh, long time no see. Um, right. I have actually, I have prepared a little bit of um, slides to uh, help me to remember what I'm talking about and to keep me on topic because uh, that's one thing once I start it's difficult to stop uh, so to keep me on topic I have tried to put together a little bit of a presentation which you will be able to see as well and I hope that I might be able to show you some short really short short videos as well uh, if the technology wants to uh, be with me. Uh, so uh, the first thing that I want to start off with is uh, telling you that uh, although I would say that I'm quite versed in, in, in English, um, it's not my first language. And usually I teach uh, nose work in Swedish. So if there's some things that I, I stumble upon uh, in terms of terminology or things, please bear with me. And I will also uh, tell you that this is a presentation from me, uh, David Svenelid, uh, as a trainer, behaviorist, and uh, although I will also go into and speak a little bit about the uh, Swedish Nose Work Club, which is the uh, proprietor of the whole sport here in Sweden, just to give you a little bit of a glimpse of what, what it's all about here in Sweden. Um, but that's uh, basically my take on things and my experience of things. I hope that you'll understand that. Um, so I'm not a representative as such for, for the Swedish Nose Work Club, uh, so to speak. Um, so with no uh, further ado, I will do like this. Ding ding! Nice, huh? Uh, so uh, what I will be talking about today is the nose work is like a sport for everyone and the um, when I was thinking about this subject I wanted to talk a little bit about the Swedish way because um, the little information that I have from around the world is that we might do it slightly different at least from from some countries out there and also um, my take on maybe why it's such a big sport, the, the fastest growing sport uh, in, in the world, uh, etc. And uh, why I like it so much as a behaviorist. Uh, I will touch on that as well and so forth. So uh, if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, please uh, do not uh, um, uh, be afraid of uh, putting questions in the comments. I will try to address them at the end. So I will be talking fairly quickly. So I will have hopefully have as much time as possible at the end to uh, to take any questions, etc. Um, so uh, basically, uh, first of all, uh, you might wonder who I am, uh, and I'm David David Svenelid, and I am a certified animal behaviorist and certified animal trainer through. Uh, I can International Companion Animal Network and also a proud member of International Canine Behaviorists uh, and of course a certified trainer through the Swedish Nosework Club. Uh, the one thing that I usually say is set up for success and I think that that's sort of uh, tying up to the whole errorless learning, thinking, uh, the fact that I like to help the dog to learn rather than uh, test it and uh, try to put it in awkward positions etc etc and also I like to think about this also when it comes to the handler because it's so important not to forget that there is actually somebody who's holding the lead 
and we need to help them also set up for success, not just for the dog, but also for the handler. And I think um, I will be moving forwards and backwards a little bit, but I think that the one thing about nose work today, which is a slightly different subject from last week when I spoke about care dogs and the care dog training, uh, because when we do work in hospitals and other working environments with our dogs, we always have the ethical questions in terms of do the dog really want to do this? Um, here in nose work and nose work world, we actually have a subject where I would say that all dogs love uh, and it's very natural and, and, and uh, all that, which makes it... Um, open up and uh, open up an understanding of uh, what we actually have in the lead and we can actually learn to know the dogs in a slightly different way from the obedience training and the agility training or whatever we are we are working on as as a very sort of more um, uh, potentially uh, structured training if that makes sense um, so that's, that's part of that and uh, these are my two dogs that you see on the picture. It's my Labrador Theodore and my um, Border Collie Tessie. And they both do uh, nose work, I can tell you. Uh, I also do some agility with my Tessie, my Border Collie. Uh, but uh, even though agility used to be one of my favorite sports, I think nose work has actually taken over a lot of it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but um, hey ho, everything has its time and all that. Uh, but the thing that I find very interesting is when I work these two dogs, even though I do the same searches with them, they do them differently and I allow them to do it differently because in nose work we do not necessarily put pressure on the fact that the dog has to search in a certain way, uh, they have to have certain search patterns, etc. They have to, to find the treasure basically. So, which I will go into in a bit. But uh, these are my two dogs that I have at the moment. You will potentially, if I have time, I will show you a, a, a film clip with my old dog, which is not with us anymore, uh, which is quite nice as well. Anyway, um, I run something called Swedish Dog Academy. And in that we have three brands. We have something called Vårdenskolan, which I spoke about last week, uh, considering the, the education program for care, dog, uh, care dogs, dogs working in uh, care homes, uh, hospitals uh, and schools, etc. So you can look back at that um, um, lecture if you want to, uh, of course. Uh, and also we have uh, a brand called Nose.Work, um, which is ours as well, which is our Nose Work brand. Uh, right, so if we go into the fact that uh, this has a history, of course, but it's quite a short history because Nose Work is, is, is ridiculously young, really, in the sense that we are talking about it today, as a sport, as an activity, in the sense that we're talking about it today. Of course, we've always done uh, nose games with our dogs in one way or another, but uh, lately it's sort of culminated into a sport and uh, an official sport in that uh, way as well. There is a, a rule book and everything like that that goes with it. So, but the history is that th these, these guys, uh, Ron Gaunt, Amy Herrett, Jill Murray O'Brien in the US, uh, sort of put this concept together. It all started at shelters where they wanted to, uh, where Ron wanted to um, uh, activate and stimulate dogs that were uh, slightly agitated and maybe maybe they'd been at these shelters for a long time uh, they were difficult to uh, to rehome etc but once he started to work the dogs with the nose and started to work the dog with the uh, sort of nose work uh, idea uh, he found that they actually calmed down a lot and they were much easier to rehome they were much easier to handle and also this was an activity that you could get all the other people working at the shelters on board with so you didn't have to have a lot of behavior knowledge to be able to train the dogs in this kind of activity which obviously helped because there was a lot of dogs that needed training so uh, and that's one of the problems with the shelters i would say that uh, sometimes they need so much special knowledge that it's difficult to get uh, get the right kind of people to to help uh, with the with the dogs that have issues so to speak
Uh, by the way, can you tell that I, I dressed up for the occasion? I have my, my lovely uh, golden uh, t-shirt on today uh, because this is how, how much I love uh, nose work. Um, anyway, uh, moving on. So these three people started off this um, uh, amazing sport and activity in the US and in, that was in 2006-ish and thereabouts. And in 2011, uh, Marie Fogelfist, which some of you might know about, even if you're in other countries, because she's quite quite well known, uh, she actually brought it over to Sweden. And we were the, as far as I am aware, and what I've been told is that we were actually the first country in the world to bring it from the US and uh, to start to sort of uh, cultivate it and try to bring it into the Swedish um, way of uh, um, training dogs. And uh, yeah, 2011 was the year, and that's not a long time ago, that's 10 years, so it's nothing really. And the thing is that in 2014 already we started up the thing called the Swedish Nosework Club, or Svenska Nosework Club. And the Swedish Nosework Club uh, is part of the uh, Swedish Kennel Club, which is quite important to understand. So it's uh, subsidiary to the, um, to the Kennel Club, basically, in this country. Uh, that means that we adhere to all the rules and regulations for the kennel club, um, just like agility, uh, rally obedience, um, and freestyle, etc. etc. Uh, and that means that the reason why the, um, the um, organization wanted to be part of uh, the kennel club was to make this an official sport basically. So because it's part of the kennel club family and organization, uh, we are uh, all the official results and everything they get uh, uh, entered into the to the um, main database of uh, dog competitions in Sweden. And uh, the ambition with the club and the uh, sport from the beginning here in Sweden, of course, similar to how it was in the US, was to create a safe, very safe fun and fun sport for all dogs and handlers. Because um, what we found, if we're looking back to some of the other sports and things around, uh, they can be quite difficult for uh, people in wheelchairs or people uh, with old dogs, uh, people with really young dogs, etc. It's sort of, they have a limit in terms of uh, physical uh, boundaries, etc. that can, can both for the handler and for the, for the dog. And that can be quite strenuous really. And a bit, um, if you're looking at, we have about 1 million dogs here in Sweden, 10 million people, 1 million dogs. Uh, so it's quite a lot. And we were looking at trying to find a way of making this sport actually available for everybody, uh, in a sense. So, um, moving on, uh, the history of the, the club in Sweden and the sport in Sweden is uh, quite remarkable. And I have actually, um, on purpose, left out 2020 because let's come on uh, 2020 didn't exist did it it's a, it's a black hole you know, as far as i can tell uh with with no competitions etc due to covid so um what i did is i brought out the numbers for um up till 2019 and uh, we have uh, i know at the beginning of 2020 when i still was the chairman for the swedish kennel club uh, swedish uh, nosework club uh, we had around 3800 members so it was one of the biggest cl clubs in in the in the kennel club's organization actually and uh, about twice the size i think from the agility club and um, also, you can tell here that in 2014 there was not a lot of members and then suddenly, uh, and suddenly things happened. In 2017, we, it became an official sport. That was when the rule book was clubbed to make sure it was uh, sort of finalized to be able to get some results uh, in, the, in the books. And the thing with the club as well was that there were some basic values that we really built up from the beginning, making sure that we had the best interest of the dog and best interest of the handlers in mind. Um, I'm not saying that other sports, dog sports, don't have this to a certain degree, but I think uh, by Nosework being such a new organization, a new sport, we could really make sure that the culture in the sport and culture of the uh, activity uh, was put as right as possible from the beginning. 
Um, so we, there was a lot of effort put, put down into making sure that uh, things were put into the basic values such as nose work is based on values about diversity, safety and the dog's mental and physical health. Uh, just to make sure that it's not something where we, we push the dogs and the rule book is made to make sure that uh, you can't uh, treat or handle your dog how, however you want. It, there is quite strict rules, even you can't even pull the lead, uh, you can't pop the lead uh, in, in, nose work, uh, in a nose work competition, then the, the judge can actually give you um, faults for that. Um, so nose work is an activity for all dogs. That's something that we also said in the club. And it's the message uh, we wanted to sort of get out there. Uh, but it means that most dogs will really um, feel good about using the main sense, uh, such as the olfaction. Um, the confusion in this has been that some people think that uh, just because it's a sport and an activity that we think that everybody should be able to do, it's not. That doesn't mean that all dogs are capable and um, able to compete because the competition um, side of things could potentially make it slightly different, difficult for some dogs, depending on how reactive and everything they are. However, it's been very interesting because we've kept a close eye on the number of um, uh, issues arriving at competitions, etc. In, in the nose work world and it's been like a handful. Uh, considering there's been hundreds and hundreds of, of competitions, it, uh, it means that the rules and the guidelines that we put together to make sure that everybody keeping safe and keeping distance and everything like that um, has actually worked uh, in a sense. Um, so that's good, I think. It means, it has meant that a lot of dogs that might be to, uh, to um, uh, have a difficulty in uh, competing in, for example, agility or rally obedience or something where there is a lot of movement, a lot of dogs around, maybe uh, slightly different to actually find a spot to, to get away from the other dogs, etc. Uh, and keeping the, the, the necessary distance, uh, they actually have a place where they can go and compete uh, and there's a lot of people who've in uh, in turn had uh, a lot of success in actually rehabilitating their dogs because they have finally found an activity which they can compete in and they can start to work on on the relationship and work on the dog's confidence and etc which the nose work can actually help with and thus taking it into uh, the real world, making them more confident when they, when they walk the streets as well and, and uh, less fearful um, and less problematic to actually cope in the everyday uh, world, which is amazing. So, um, and I can tell you that uh, one of the things that Marie Fogelqvist really felt when she brought this sport into Sweden was just this, to make sure that people learn to read the dogs, learn to work with the dogs and learn to find uh, uh, an activity that can, uh, can really uh, boost their relationship. Uh, and she succeeded for sure. This is just some more numbers just to make, make you understand how big it is in Sweden. And uh, this sounds like, well, that's nothing. But for a sport which is so young, <laughs> starting in 2017 and also in little Sweden with 10,000 people, 1 million dogs, etc. It's quite remarkable because uh, it started off with 5,000 starts at official competitions around the country in just the first year of, uh, of running official competitions. And in 2018, it was almost the double with 9,000 starts. Uh, and then we went up 2019 with uh, another 4,000 starts basically. So then we ended up with 13,000 starts. So um, this has been quite interesting because I was uh, the chairman of this organization between March 2018 and June 2020. And so that was approximately, well, two years plus. And uh, it's been quite an interesting journey to be part of an organization that uh, early on to see how it grows and the um, uh, how it grows maybe too quickly uh, in some expect uh, some sense and also where some parts don't really uh, come with and you have to sort of 
make sure there is a balance not to grow too fast basically um, now 2020 was a, as it, again it was a black hole so we don't talk about that we don't uh, we just zip 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 and the thing that we found with nose work though is that uh, because it's an activity that you can do quite easily uh, on uh, at your home turf so to speak you you even though we have not had competitions uh, official competitions there's been um, possibilities for people to train a lot at home train with maybe uh, friends in the bubbles and and uh, make sure that they um, uh, the dog still sort of keeping up the activity because let's face it the dog don't really care about the the uh, medals and the uh, results going into the database etc uh, the dog likes and and care about the work there and then so uh, if it's training or if it's uh, official competition I would say that the dog probably just don't give a shit. So um, moving on um, to uh, what is nose work, because I realized that maybe not everybody knows what it is. And the basics here in Sweden, just to, to make, make sure that you understand some of the differences, because I know that the, uh, a lot of countries use uh, oils instead of, um, of hydrolates, which we do. Um, but the first basic rule is that nose work is a treasure hunt. It's about finding that treasure. And when the dog finds treasure, we are happy. Basically, so the dog has to use its nose to find a treasure and the treasure happens to be uh, some kind of hide with uh, hydrolate and um, hydrolates is um, it's a water based um, liquid um, with, with a sense of eucalyptus bay leaf or or lavender. So not all three in, in ones. It's one or the other. And it's um, basically the, th the, the, the steam that you uh, that, uh, come up from cooking the oils, when you do ethereal oils, oils uh, you get steam and that steam is collected and when that uh, vaporizes and becomes um, a liquid again, that's what the, what the base is for the hydrolytes. Um, because this is water-based instead of oils, it's obviously much easier to handle in terms of uh, contamination. Um, because uh, if you get a drop of oil on something where it's not supposed to be, you can, uh, well, you, you, you're screwed, basically. Um, so you obviously have to be very careful. Now I know that people who use oils and countries where you use oils, you cook them, you, you cook the, the hides in a different area, etc. But you can still sort of uh, um, uh, think about the, uh, the easiness in using hydrolytes, maybe. The thing that we also found is that when we started with, um, when we first got nose work to Sweden, the, uh, there was some, uh, some people really questioning why we wanted to get oils and particularly oils with uh, uh, that, the oils with cedar oils, etc. that was used in, in the US because uh, they, were, they are actually poisonous to dogs. And uh, there was this, this was so early on that really quickly they had a meeting and they actually said to these people, well, bring, uh, take, uh, give us three scents that we can use for dogs that will not be, be harmful for them uh, at all. And uh, these, these three were the ones that they actually found for us. So uh, that's why uh, we have eucalyptus, bay leaf and lavender. Um, and... I would say that uh, when you cook oils in different in, in other countries, uh, when you cook the hides, I should say, with oils, uh, you obviously make a, put a drop and loads of different um, uh, um, Q-tips, for example, in a in a in a box, and you let them stay there for a while, and they get particles on them, etc. But uh, what we do with the hydrolate is we actually drop one drop of the um, uh, hydrolate onto a um, uh, furniture pad or a, um, a Q-tip, uh, basically, and that's what we hide. We teach the dogs to, I should say that in competitions it's always about one drop, it, 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 but a drop can be, 
I know you can argue that is it uh, uh, really strict that if we put a drop on from one bottle will it be a, uh, exactly the same as from a different bottle or, or, or whatever. Uh, maybe not, but it's still within reason a similar amount. Uh, when you train the dogs, you can still train the dogs in loads of different amounts if you would like, uh, of course, but we can get back to training and things later on. Um, but we use a drop of uh, hydrates to uh, of one of these uh, scents. And we should go on to say that the in Sweden, as uh, and uh, in many other countries, there are four different elements that we do searches in. So we have the container search, we have the interior um, building search, we have the exterior um, area search, and the vehicle search. I will show you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and in a competition, you always do four searches. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit complicated maybe, but what we do here in Sweden at least is that we have actually five different types of competitions. We have something that we call um, sort of competition all elements in a direct translation. And that means that you do one container search, one interior search, one exterior search and one vehicle search. But then we also have a single elements. So we do four searches, uh, container searches or for interior searches, or for exterior searches, etc. Uh, so we can actually compete in five different types of competitions when it comes to nose work. It's not just nose work, it's five different uh, types of competitions. And in all these five, you can be in different levels as well. So you can have diplomas and be in, in, um, in class two in um, maybe in, uh, in vehicle searches, but uh, in um, in all um, elements, you might just be on on uh, class one, so they're not they are independent from each other. That should be quite good to know as well. Uh, again, this might be the same in your country. I don't know. Um, so we have three classes in Sweden, uh, which I think is the same in in most countries. Uh, it's just that you use different types of uh, scents in, in in different countries, and in our uh, class 1 we only use the eucalyptus and in class 2 we get the bay leaf as a second possible option uh, and that means that even if it's a class 2 search it doesn't have to include bay leaf it can include bay leaf but it could be just the eucalyptus in that one as well or just bay leaf uh, you know whatever but it doesn't have to be there you, you as a judge you have the op option to use two and in class 3 we add lavender as well so the third um, uh, scent basically and uh, except for the scents it's really important to understand that there's loads of other difficulties that vary in between these classes as well for example in class two we have uh, we have loads a lot larger search areas first of all we have maybe more than one room that we uh, we have to search off to to find the um, the hides and in class one there is always just one hide while in class two there can be two hides uh, so you get a little bit different uh, ways of working with the um, time because everything is timed so uh, how you how you turn off the time and everything like that becomes a little bit more complicated for the handler uh, because you might have to uh, you have to actually tell the judge when you are finished rather than um, just uh, that it's automatically finished when you find the eucalyptus in class one uh, stuff like that and also the the height of the um, scent and also how difficult it's it uh, it's put where where is it hiding uh, how difficult is it for the dog to actually find it etc so that those sort of things actually add on to that in class three it's one step further up in terms of com complication uh, for the um, uh, for the handler and for the dog bigger areas more rooms but also one of the biggest things that actually is added in class three is that you can have an empty search so there could be uh, a search for five minutes without there being any hides at all uh, and you have to be able to tell uh, if your dog uh, thinks there is something to work on or not basically and when it's finished searching and you have to trust your dog so that puts on a different type of um, level of understanding your dog and working together uh, so that's uh, quite interesting I think um, <clears throat> Mm. 
yes. Um, right, so uh, what I was um, thinking about as well when I wanted to do this talk, I was thinking that before, one, one of the things that I, I think that not all countries have out there is some kind of test to make sure that the dog actually knows the, the scent that they are competing in. And uh, so here in Sweden we have something called a scent test, um, in a direct translation basically. And what it means is that if you want to compete in class 1, you have to do a scent test for eucalyptus before you actually enter the competition. So that's the, the lowest merit that you have to have to be able to go into the competition ring. And one of the reasons why we have a scent test here in Sweden is to make sure that the dog has some kind of clue what it's actually all about. And also that you as a handler has some kind of clue what it's actually about. Even though the scent test is a, a much simpler thing compared to a competition in terms of rules, there's not many rules saying that you have to do this, that and the other, um, it's uh, it's basically a yay or a nay. Can you handle it, can you not? Can you can you see if the dog finds the scent or not? Can the dog find the scent or not? It's, it's that simple. Uh, and if it doesn't manage to find and, and complete a scent test then you would argue that then maybe you shouldn't put the dog into the uh, competition ring. So again back to the ethical questions that I ask myself every now and then it's like we don't want to put this put the dogs in situations where, where they don't belong. Uh, so uh, this is a way of checking that. And this brings us into another difference I think in uh, between Sweden and some other countries is that we uh, the result in the nose work world at the moment, I have to add, because this might change in the future. We're going through a, a, a big change of rule, rules at the moment, uh, which will be finished 2022, I think. Uh, but what we have at the moment is that the results follow the team. So it's not just the dog, it's actually following the team. So you as a handler and the dog form a team and you together have results. So basically the same dog with a different handler in the same family or something could also compete, but then you are a team and you have your own results and your own uh, diplomas, etc. Uh, in the different classes to follow. So uh, whereas in, in some other sports and most other sports, I would say in sport in, in here in Sweden at least, the results follow the dog. So even if a uh, um, another handler in the family, for example, want to compete with the dog. They have to do it in the in the level where the dog is at the moment. So uh, the scent test is a way of making sure that the handler can actually tell that the dog has the scent in the nose, uh, and they actually know how the dog looks when it's uh, finding the, the scent. Um, and I think I have a little. Um, uh, what's it called, a little, 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 little uh, video uh, of how a uh, uh, scent test can look-ish. Um, well, we'll have a look and see if the technology wants to be with me. So, there is 12 boxes, always and in a scent test in two lines and they have to be quite far apart uh, to make sure that it's very clear which uh, container yeah. the dog actually mark on and then the uh, person can uh, tell you uh, let's see uh, can i do that yes so 12 12 uh, containers uh, there's one box with scent on uh, and uh, in this Kind of test it's the dog has three minutes to complete it because it's not a matter of it uh, having to go fast uh, you can tell yeah and then the judge says yes or no right so that's how a scent test could look basically some dogs do it in 10 seconds and then they're finished some dogs do it in two minutes and nine uh, and 54 seconds that's fine it's three minutes it's a yay or an a so even if you finish it early you don't get like a grand prize or anything like that you just finish it or not uh, so that's how a scent test can look in the um uh, Bayleaf and the lavender uh, scent test, you, there, there will also be, um, uh, what's that called in English, um, false scents, uh, so to speak, um, uh, ways of um, 
uh, sort of trying to make sure that the dog doesn't go on a pine cone, for example, or something like that. Um, good question um, uh, here. Uh, are competitors told which scent is hidden in class two or three? No. In class two, you do get the information of how many hides there are, but not uh, what scents are used. Uh, so it could be that if you have um, the four, um, like all the different elements, so maybe in the interior uh, search, there is two scents, uh, two heights, and it could be a eucalyptus and, and bay leaf. In the exterior, it's just one, and it might just be bay leaf. In the uh, uh, container search, it could be just one, and that's uh, eucalyptus, for example. And in uh, vehicle search, it can be two, and that two could be just bay leaf, for example. So there can be, and the only thing you get uh, to know is the maximum time of your search, which area is the search, and if there is any safety things to t take care of or think of in terms of uh, don't go too far that way because uh, then, you know, there is sheep over there, yeah, over that hill or something, uh, I don't know, uh, but also uh, how many heights there are. And this is where a lot of people go wrong, because if, even if uh, the judge tell you that there are uh, just one uh, scent in here, or one hide, uh, and they go in, they search, but they're so nervous, and they're finding the one, one hide, uh, marking it, uh, and then they continue searching, but they're not stopping the clock because they think that there always will be two. They, they've sort of for, forgotten the information and uh, then the clock ticks and uh, the, um, the results will be less good, I should say. Mm -hmm. So that will be, uh, that's quite an interesting thing. Right, so I'll um, try to find my way back. Uh, Oh, I should say as well though that you you asked about the uh, class three, and in the class three you don't get to know uh, how many hides there are either, because uh, then the the empty searches would be too easy, wouldn't they? <laughs> so in that one you just literally get the the um, maximum amount of time and what the search area is, and uh, and then yeah, you're set to go. Um, so the container search, I, I dug out a, a quick a short video actually that I had on my dog uh, just showing how this could be. And it's actually uh, similar to the, to the scent test, but because there's man, minimum 12 containers in a container search. And it could be anything from uh, cardboard boxes to bags, etc. In class one, there's always just cardboard boxes in a competition. Doesn't mean that you're, you can't uh, train and and uh, do exercises at home on different things, of course. But in competitions, it's always uh, some kind of um, uh, cardboard boxes. Uh, but I'll show you. Uh, hopefully, you can see this video. As well. Just showing them for myself. I hope that you could uh, could see them. Yeah, yeah. It looks like there's some kind of results. Okay, good. Um, so basically, uh, that could be a container search, a simple one, um, just to show you a little bit what it's all about. Uh, the thing with container search compared to the interior searches, etc., is that the dog has to show you which container, but it doesn't need to say exactly where on the container it is. So if it's on a larger, for example, bag or something like that, uh, we can uh, the dog just have to tell you which container it is, rather than if it's on uh, in an interior search, it's. Um, 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 you might have to at least give the judge some kind of indication of where you think it might be, so within reason. So that would be good to know. I got a few questions here now that I want to take straight away. Do the dogs mark different scents uh, differently? Sit, lay down, bark, or is it just about finding the scent? 
perfect question because that brings me into this thing where if uh, in nose work there's no rule book in how the dog has to show you. The, the, in the nose work the dog can show you in, in loads of different ways as long as you as a handler can tell that the dog finds it basically. The only thing that could be is that if it's not clear to the to the judge that the dog has actually marked on something, so to speak, done a final, some kind of final behavior, I usually call it, because um, uh, marking is uh, sometimes uh, very strict in terms of what, what we're talking about. But uh, some kind of final behavior, um, and the judge can tell that, well, it's because the scent is there and it can tell that it's right. But if the judge can't tell you and tell that on the dog and what it sees, uh, the um, competitor might have to actually uh, show the judge where he, think he thinks it is. Uh, and, and that's what I mean with might be might have to actually show where it is. But when it comes to the actual uh, marking or the behavior the dog has to do to, to show you where, where the scent is, it's, it's literally just up to you as a handler and to the dog. And usually my, my um, preferred way of doing this is actually teach the dog the scents first. Teach the dog searching and then when that's starting to work out and you're teaching the dog and actually reward, rewarding for the finding of the scent, then you suddenly start to naturally get some kind of behavior, some kind of final behavior from the dog, um, which you can sort of build upon. And usually that is the, the best way, I would say, because it comes naturally to the dog. And it brings it in very nicely, naturally, because if you, uh, from my experience, if you put too much uh, emphasis on the marking and the on the final behavior, we do tend to get dogs with uh, who which mark falsely, uh, because the the behavior, that actual behavior, weighs heavier than finding the scent, and the connection between scent and the behavior is not made properly, not 100%. So uh, there are some caveats to think about there when we're training the dogs, I would say. And if you look at the dog uh, when it's searching, you will find something that we call a change of behavior, which is slightly different from the final behavior. Change of behavior is something that you get when the dog gets in the scent cone, when it gets in the scent, uh, scent trail, and it's sort of something's happening with the dog. It's twitching, it's, uh, the, the nose starts to work differently, the tail works differently, some dogs start to wag it really heavily, some dogs stop and wag it really slowly, uh, higher the, the tail, lower the tail, you know, it can be loads of different things that you have to look at your dog and see how it, um, how it behaves. However, um, this change of behavior is actually more information to me as a handler and as a trainer, I would say, than an actual final uh, behavior, because the final behavior can be a ruse. <laughs> um, so we have to be careful. And the, the reason we get falsely marking, false markings, etc., is usually because the dog gets frustrated, tired, uh, we might not, uh, we might make it too difficult for them, etc. Um, so, yeah, just going off on a tangent, but it's still related. Um, let's see. I hope that answers your questions. If it doesn't answer your questions when I ramble on, please do tell me uh, so I can address it again. Um, question. If uh, in the video you uh, have rewarded dog in a search area, is this allowed when competing or do you need to leave search area before rewarding? Yes, you are such good uh, listeners because this is a perfect question. Because in Sweden and in Nosework we are allowed to, to treat and reward our dogs in competing, in the search area. And we are allowed to actually uh, have a break in the search area if we need to and just treat the dogs. The only time we're not allowed to give the dog a treat in Nosework competition is from the moment that we think the dog has found the scent and we say it's here, uh, from that moment until the judge has said yes or no, you are not allowed to treat the dog. 
Okay, that's the only time you you are not allowed to to do that. Uh, otherwise, you can you can pet and you can you can encourage and you can work with your dog just the way you would do in a in a in a in a training environment. The, and and uh, what I would argue I would add as well is that you're not allowed to drop treats. If you do that, it's contamination, and if you contaminate, you get the. Uh, um, faults from the judge basically so uh, as long as you handle it correctly uh, then it's no problems at all uh, which I love as a behaviorist and as a trainer and somebody working with errorless learning and somebody working with with um, encouragement and uh, positive reinforcement and positive training I think that's perfect that we are actually allowed to do that in that competition ring as well so yeah Ooh, I got a little bit excited there, I felt uh, um, Great, okay. Um, I do have a, a slightly small video on the interior building search as well, actually, that I can show you uh, just briefly. Uh, and that's also, uh, and the thing is to remember here that this is uh, in an area where uh, it can be, we say that an interior building search has to have at least three walls and a roof, okay? So uh, garage, etc. It could be, but a uh, carport, mm, borderline, and um, we, we think that it should be. It has. It can be cold in there. That's not a problem uh, as such. But it has to be some kind of, you know, uh, building uh, rather than just a roof. Um, so just to, to to remind you. So let's see. <coughs> cute <laughs> he's so fun to work with uh, my Theodore uh, anyway uh, I just want to show you really quickly uh, a tip like some kind of interior uh, building search so it can uh, it, it's basically that the scent is usually or the hide is usually put somewhere on, on furniture or, or in like a room or something like that and uh, this is where if it's high up and this is quite interesting actually because of the question about the, the um, uh, if the dog uh, marked differently depending on the sense uh, previously if I'm going back to that it's uh, same dog can mark differently on different uh, hides I don't say scents I say hides because even if it's eucalyptus if it's a low hide it can mark in a one way and if it's a high hide uh, high, uh, high up hide uh, it's uh, they might m mark it differently so some dogs might uh, in a container search for example when they find it they might lie down because it's it's closer to the to the floor uh, and same in like an interior or exterior when it's sort of low down however if it's in a high um, like 120 uh, something like that uh, high up like here somewhere um, uh, then maybe the dog actually sits uh, and and, and uh, tells, tells the owner where it is um, so it's one marking behavior and not different kinds depending on the scent found is you down mark six exactly no it's not different because what we care about is finding the treasure we don't care if it's a, if it's silver gold or diamonds in the treasure we we basically just want the dog to tell us that there is a treasure so uh, uh, and how it tells us we don't care some dogs uh, can actually um, uh, pick up on, on different types of uh, markings uh, different types of showing us uh, depending on the scent however uh, we don't care to be honest it, it, it's not wrong but it's not something that we have to have either so yeah um, right uh, if we're thinking about the exterior search, that can be a, a slightly different. And the thing that we have in the exterior that we don't have in in the interior and and container searches indoors, particularly. But I should add that a container search could be outdoors as well. Uh, so what we have here is we have uh, different uh, smells in the in the soil, in the uh, the birds flying around uh, in the trees, moving uh, leaves, um, wind, weather, etc. So obviously it becomes slightly different, uh, difficult depending on the dog. So this is a just a short video of uh, how this. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, I freeze uh, and uh, and then it looks up at me, I look back. Uh, that's usually the way that the Theo tells me that there is some scent uh, or a hide, I should say. Uh, and you could tell, uh, this is a particularly good one maybe to show the fact that it doesn't matter if it's high or low. Uh, so if we look at it again. <laughs> good thank you for telling me uh, that you couldn't hear, hear me when when I speak during the video I didn't know that so what I was trying to say is that you could tell that he was showing slightly different from on the high on and the low uh, on the low one he start, he almost does like a like a bow at the same time um, so but it doesn't really matter all I want is for him to do a little freeze and then look at me as well uh, so that's that uh, I can Probably video music is loud. Oh, I didn't even know there was music on it. Um, okay, thank you. I will see if that's uh, something I can sort out in the next one. Uh, right, so on a vehicle search, the thing that's really important to remember here is that uh, it's all about uh, the exterior of the um, uh, vehicle not internally and it's um, the one thing that actually is added here here in Sweden uh, in the rules is that the dog is not allowed to put paws onto the vehicles or not onto the the um, uh, the car area so to speak the um, uh, with the um, uh, with the paint work on to make sure that they can't uh, actually uh, sort of destroy it. So they're allowed to put the paws onto the wheels um, uh, and, and that sort of thing. And also if it's a vehicle which is more like a trailer or something like that, then they might be allowed to do it as well. But then you get the information from the judge uh, if if it's uh, possible to do it in that one. Uh, this is probably one of the types of search elements where we've had most controversial discussions here in Sweden. There is a lot of divide between people uh, in terms of how they want this type of, type of um, element to be construed in a competition environment. And um, I think that the rules from the beginning was based on the um, fact that if you are a dog working in the customs, for example, looking for drugs, you can't have dogs sort of jumping up on the cars, etc. all the time because uh, the authorities would be bankrupt basically for, for having to pay for all the damage that the dogs would uh, put on there. So they teach the dogs to actually work uh, around the vehicles from the ground um, initially. Uh, then as somebody said, if they do find something and they, they feel they really have to get up on the vehicle, then they're usually so sure because they are really, really, really well trained, uh, which means that the, uh, they will find some drugs. And if they find drugs, obviously, you know, they don't care how much damage they do to the car ish. Uh, yeah. Um, but I'll see uh, if I can just do this then. Hang on. Um, right, so um, uh, as you can tell here, it was just a quick little search just to show you uh, uh, how it could look. And what, what we are looking at in the vehicle search uh, compared to the other ones is that it's a much more 
um, uh, we steer the dog slightly differently. Uh, the one thing that I like with this video as well, that it shows this thing where we're not allowed to pull the dogs with us. So even if he didn't, he wasn't finished with his search, he felt that he wanted to search more. Uh, so you could tell that the, the lead actually got a little bit tighter. Uh, when I wanted to go away. But at that end, and at that point, you're not allowed to pull dogs with you. You're allowed to stop the dog, you're allowed to break the dog, but you're now, you're not allowed to actually uh, pull it with you. So you can stop or break, make a little break sort of thing. So your dog does you just have to slow down where if it's sort of pulling towards something. And then you call the dogs with you. So you have to work with your relationship and have to work with your teamwork basically to, to uh, uh, in those work. And yes, there was no music because I turned it down straight away when I started it. So uh, I learn, I learn. It's new technology for me. Uh, thank you for telling me, Bessie. Is height adapted to how tall or small the dog is? Is a question as well. Thank you. Yes, it is adapted in class one. It's adapted to the lowest dog in the class. And that's why when you enter a competition, you have to um, give them your, um, your dog's height, basically. Uh, so uh, you have to make sure that the dog gets, uh, should be able to get to, to the scent without any issues, basically. Uh, in class one. In class two and three, uh, they don't care. Then it doesn't matter if you have a little chihuahua, then it can still be a hide up at one, 180, which is uh, like here on me. Uh, so uh, that, that's quite high. Uh, and they manage it, they do it, they, they do it without any problems. Obviously you need to train, but uh, you, you can do it. It's no issues. So uh, I just have a few more minutes here, so I'll just, uh, luckily, actually I'm almost uh, finished with slides, so I can take some more questions after that. Um, so um, what I'm after here is that nose work is a perfect activity. And even though it's a competition, it's a sport, where you, you know, it's an official sport, where you can get uh, trophies and medals and, and uh, diplomas, and you can, you know, rise in the, in the um, in the levels or the classes uh, but however we have to remember why we do this from the beginning and nose work is there for the dog it's a sport or activity where uh, we use something that really stimulates the dog mentally and also it's a dog um, where it has the ability to use its main sense uh, the olfactory system and also what I love about nose work, which I've touched on a few times here, at least from the questions and the answers to your questions, is that the, the dog has the lead role. It's not me as an owner or, or a handler who has the lead role in this one. It's the dog. The dog has the nose, the nose to do the job. I only present it to give it help to, to cope and to, uh, to actually manage the um, search environment basically. But I don't know where it is. I will never know where it is because my nose is not as good as uh, the dog is. Dogs is. So um, it's really putting it on to the dog being the leader, the, the leader of this kind of activity, which is very, it brings us into the fact that it's really good for nervous dogs. It's really good for dogs who are, might have um, some environmental issues or dog-to-dog um, -dog aggression or what have you. I'm not saying that you, you go out today and do some nose work and it'll be fine, but it's a great tool to use in your behavioral uh, work. I've used it with dogs uh, that have been um, uh, had uh, electrical shock um, uh, from uh, electrical fencing uh, and have uh, had some trauma in, in different environments. We used nose work to actually uh, get around that kind of issue um, that, that arose from that. I've used it to uh, to treat a lot of dogs from from. Uh, that have had real lack of self-confidence, uh, basically, um, and, and etc. I can go on, go on, go on. But it's 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 really interesting. It's really good in in a lot of sense. But it's the dog has the lead role. It's not me as owner. Uh, I have to let the dog and build the dog up to be able to take uh, decisions on its own. It's quite simple and easy to train. You don't have to um, do it complicated and you, you don't have to aim for the stars. I would say that this is, is an activity that every dog can do. Three-legged, 
air dogs, uh, blind dogs, um, deaf dogs, um, dogs, as I say, with, with issues in different ways that we want to work with. Um, this is something that we can, can do in one way or another with our dogs. And uh, the, the, when I was chairman for the organization, I was sort of one of the biggest um, I won a big competition and I, I handed out the, the trophies, etc. Um, at the end. Uh, and the oldest person there, I think, was 82 years old with a 13-year-old dog. And she ended up on the, uh, uh, on, if she was number, number two or number three on the uh, uh, prizes, I can't tell, but uh, I can't remember. But again, how, in what other sports can we find that kind of diversity? And again, in the um, in the uh, lead charts, you find all different types of uh, uh, dog breeds, uh, which means that it's not just uh, the fastest dog or the slowest dog or the smallest dog or the biggest dog that actually can cope. It's it's quite different, very uh, very varied. And again, it's really interesting when I train my two dogs. It's a border collie and a. Uh, uh, Labrador, working Labrador, and uh, they work the areas very differently, but they usually find and complete the task of finding the treasure in about the same time. But my Labrador, he, he runs and covers much more area. My, my uh, little uh, border collie, she's a bitch. And she's, uh, she's, she's just very clever. She doesn't do any work that's not worth doing. So she does it really much more sensible. Uh, so, you know, it's really interesting. Anyway, back to the fact that it doesn't necessarily demand complex equipment because you can do it quite simple. If you want to, of course, you can do can get expensive equipment in terms of uh, scent work um, um, boxes, etc. But you don't have to. Um, you can do this at home uh, if you want to. The only thing that I say is to try to get help from a, a certified instructor because it will make sure that you don't train wrong in, in the first instance, at least. Um, and in Sweden, we have uh, all the certified instructors from uh, from the Swedish Snowsport Club is on their website, snwk.se. So if you're looking for one close to you, uh, go onto their website basically to to uh, to look into it. Um, well, I probably have loads more information that I wanted to give to you, but uh, you know, an hour is quite. Uh, quite fast so i hope that you've learned something and maybe maybe brought some information with you um is there any other questions that you find um that i should answer at the moment not nothing popping up in the comments field at least at the moment well let's just say like this uh, if there is any questions Please do not hesitate to contact me. Um, you you know where to find me. You have my Instagram is uh, David underscore Svenlid, and you'll find me on there. Uh, you find me on info at uh, nose.work as well if you uh, want to. Um, yes, I I do um, offer online one to ones or similar. Absolutely. So if you want anything like that, just uh, give me a shout. If you are a group that wants some kind of online classes or anything like that, even if it's in English, I don't mind doing that as well. I can sort you out. I have all the technical bits in place to be able to do it online as well, if you're in different countries. Um, and my main goal is to do this for the dogs. Uh, my main goal is to do this for the dogs, for them, for their well-being, to have fun with the dogs. And at the same time, of course, we can compete if we want to. Um, yes. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you found it interesting. Again, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. And now I think I'll say thank you for tonight and uh, happy Easter. Yes. Right. Sweden saying goodbye. <laughs>